and I'm so short, so we'll try my best. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Both my mother and my father were short, so I did not get that part of the the genes, but hello, good morning everyone. <laughs> My name is uh, Sophia Koziakis. Um, I'm a South African living in Norway and working for the University of Oslo. Um, I'm really honored and proud to be working with the education team, DHIS2 for Education. Um, it's myself and Knut Staring, up, uh, upstate New York, who um, are really working together closely with the HISP network and with the ministries of education to, to really define and understand what it is that DHIS2 can contribute towards the, the education sector. But hopefully also to help DHIS2 understand how, how nuanced the education sector is. Um, and I think what I uh, enjoy the most is that DHIS2 does not come to replace other systems, but can hopefully work well and complement where there are gaps. So I think there's a, it's a green field and uh, it's exciting, but I think there's also a lot of important uh, questions to be asking and, um, and, and research and, and knowledge generation to, to, be, to be developed. So we really appreciate the fact that we can have an education dedicated plenary session. We have a really lovely lineup of speakers, uh, both from the UNESCO IIEP, which is the International Institute for Educational Planning, as well as the Ministry of Education from the Kingdom of Eswatini and UNICEF Eswatini. So we unfortunately can't have one of our colleagues, Stan Maposa, here with us today from the planning department, but Stan, if you're online, you're here with us in, in spirit. So. Um, just as a quick introduction, I think importantly um, to say thank you to Christine and Ulla and the team for allowing education to come into the, the family. Uh, education is such an important and uh, important part of, of our societies. It's a it's a human right. It's a force for sustainable de development, for peace. Um, every goal in the 2030 agenda requires education to really empower people with the, the knowledge and the skills. Um, that they need to build their societies to, to, and to live a life they have reason to, to value. But we have so many mi millions of children that are out of school, children and youth that are out of school, those that are in school, many are not learning basic numeracy and literacy skills when they are sitting on, on school benches. And so many adults are, are illiterate still, so this is having a ricochet effect as we work our way through our educational careers and into the workforce. And the SDG 4 roadmap, the goal for education, it does gui give guidance to governments and to partners on how to turn these commitments that we have into action. But really, the education sector still faces two really broad education uh, data challenges. And that is the availability of timely data and the limited use of data. And what we've found is that responses to these challenges um, often fail to build the required capacity to maintain and evolve systems and data practices over time. Um, so there's an important, even, sorry, to just take a step back. Um, with schools or learning institutions rarely seeing reporting uh, burdens translated into locally relevant action. Data systems are the basis for policy and priority development, but they still require really extensive capacity strengthening to implement reforms in many countries and to mitigate inconsistent use of data. So we have these long-standing issues in the education sector, but we really see a growing demand for innovation in education data production and use. So we have managers and policymakers increasingly expected to answer questions about not just numbers in a classroom or uh, the number of desks or very kind of annual census type questions, but also answer questions about teaching and learning processes, about learning outcomes of our, of our children and youth, and pathways that they need to take if they can't go the formal route. Diversity, equity, social inclusion, and really these long-term outcomes of learners. So we need to track and follow individuals over a long time through many, many, um, through an entire career of education. And a really high bar has been placed on education management information systems. We have really complex and growingly complex education systems. There's national, there's regional, there's international monitoring requirements. And there's really an increased need for real-time data to, from EMIS to support learning. And of course, an additional layer is the need for EMIS to support learning continuity and monitoring in the event of a crisis, which we know is happening far too much in our world today, so that we can facilitate uninterrupted access to education for, for children and youth across the world. 
So with this very broad, uh, quick background, we thought it would be good before we go into our country story panel to also introduce you to uh, Amélie Gagnon, who is working for UNESCO, uh, the International Institute for Educational Planning. We're really honored to have you here with us today. Um, she will just give us a brief remark, really, about the evolving conceptual boundaries of education management information systems and thinking about how to adapt to the nuances of the education sector. So I think this can help us to place um, education within the broader information strengthening uh, discussion. So I believe, please feel free to, to come up and join us, and I think your presentation is ready to... Oops. Thank you. Here we go. Just keep this here. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, as uh, Sophia mentioned, I work at IIP. I'm also a demographer, so I cannot help myself and will ask a few questions to learn about you. <laughs> so, uh, who of you, uh, uh, who uh, has ever been to school? Raise your hand. <laughs> Primary school. Everybody, yeah? <laughs> All right. Who, who here is actually uh, working in the education sector, either as a teacher, manager, planner? Colleagues in the back, a few here. Oh, I'm so glad to have you here. It's excellent. Actually, what, what, it's a bit like football. You know, yesterday I was listening to uh, our colleague from South Sudan, Director General uh, in uh, Health and uh, Emergency Response, and was doing some analogies with, with football. And I think education is a bit like this, right? Everybody went to school, so everybody thinks that can manage the team, right? And so well, that's why it's sometimes difficult to have um, actual um, a discussion to, to show the kind of nuances and the differences between the different sectors. Um, I work at IIP and our mandate basically is to support ministries of education and ministries plural, not only because there are many in the world, but also because within uh, countries, sometimes there are different ministries that manage different um, programs or sub-programs of education. And so we su support them through technical cooperation, applied research, and professional training. So we have different types of programs uh, online, on site, um, different durations, different equivalencies to with national uh, education system. And so we, that keeps us really busy. And we have three offices. I'm based in Paris, but also uh, we have colleagues in Dakar and Buenos Aires. We have kind of a, a regional uh, distribution of, of work. So why do we need an EMIS? Um, the, of course, I'm assuming everybody has figured education management information system, right? Um, oh. Perhaps this clicker works. The assumption is if we have better data, then we will be able to do better monitoring. Then it means that we will make better decisions, better implementation of the plans, the policies, the different programs and projects. And therefore, the children will have better learning uh, outcomes, better uh, scores in the test, but also uh, better fulfilling uh, jobs when they leave the, 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 the school, and any types of uh, educational results, better quality, better quantity, better equity also in the system. This will be reflected in society as a whole. And I'm assuming, I mean, I'm saying all this, but I'm assuming that in your mind, you know, you're already tracing all the parallels with the health sector. When we talk about NMS, and we try to define this, I mean, I'm kind of drawing the, the conceptual boundaries because there's many definitions that we use in education, but I think this is the longest one I'm going to present this morning, but it's also perhaps the most, most complete one that helps us to really frame what we need in education when we talk about MSs. And so, an MS, what is it? Is it a, co a coordinated network of people, organization, institution, different technologies, softwares, processes, Procedures also, we have to think about the procedures, the rules, all the kind of legal frameworks that support uh, uh, data management, and that, that this coordinated network needs to produce fit for purpose data. And what, when we talk about fitness for purpose, well, we, we have to make sure that we collect the right amount of information that we will use, and we don't spend time collecting information that will just stay in the databases. And so, quality has different dimensions, but of course, the better quality, the better um, the better uh, results. Uh, as we say, you know, garbage in, garbage out. It works with every sector, and education is not an exception. For, 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 who, for who are we building these emises? Well, it, of course, everything that is an emiss needs to be 
useful for planners and managers, regardless of you know, if they're working in primary education, secondary, tertiary education, or even preschool, regardless if they work in uh, general education or TVET, or technical professional training, um, uh, regardless if they work in the public sector or, or they manage also aspects of the private sector, uh, even if they work at the central level, but also at uh, province, region, district, even at school level. So we have to cater for different users, different types of needs. The, the, we talked a lot this week about the interoperability of the data sets, the different functions, the different apps that we have in DHS2. Um, we also have to think about uh, how we collect data, how we process them, manage, store, uh, eventually archive them, and how do we make them useful for analysis and also for decision making, obviously. And all this is part of an actual MS, and we tend to forget actually that this is also part of what is the MS. In education, of course, we have to collect information on, on users of the system, so that the students, the learners, but also on the staff, teaching staff, non-teaching staff, but also all the different kind of mechanisms that support the, uh, the, um, the education delivery. So the infrastructure, the different learning materials, textbooks, uh, chairs, benches, whatever, uh, the financial resources also. And finance, I think we learn, uh, we will hear from colleagues a bit later, but finance is something that is uh, sometimes uh, overlooked in our data management systems in health as well as in education. Um, of course, we have quantitative and qualitative data. Um, maybe you remember your inspect inspector visits at school when you have someone from outside coming in the school to see how teachers are teaching, to make a survey of how the school is being run. So inspection uh, reports are very useful also uh, as a source of data. And so we have to capture all this and make this data all usable altogether. And one of the last aspects is also about governance. Governance is super important and super messy sometimes, uh, but it's all about creating these legal frameworks, these, these procedures, these uh, definitions, these processes for accountability uh, to make sure that the MS is, or data production as a whole, if we use a kind of an umbrella term, that data, data is being produced, used, uh, and, and maintained in a sustainable way, and so in an accountable and sustainable way. And so that's why we emphasize the fact that we need to sustain uh, financing of MSs. And so we, I heard colleagues from, um, from Togo mention that on Monday. And we also have to sustain uh, the professional capacity uh, of people to use and maintain and improve these, these emissions. And I heard that, that also being mentioned yesterday in, a, in, in one of the sessions. And of course, we have a lot of issues around data ethics. We're collecting information on people, uh, on very young people sometimes, and so we have to make sure that we treat these data uh, very carefully. Uh, I think there's a session even today or tomorrow on this, on this issue, so I encourage everyone to, uh, everyone to attend. So why are, are, are we defining all these types of, of elements of an MS? Well, it's because that these are uh, probably the most holistic way to see an MS, but also these are just as many entry points for, uh, for, for work, for, uh, for specialization, for expertise, and also for improving the technical aspects of, of our of software our systems, but also doing some research and uh, the professional training uh, to, to make sure that these, these MSs evolve as education systems evolve as they're being transformed, and we will hear from Iswatini also, and uh, that has been transforming his education system over the years. And also with, uh, with this, this capacity to, to always have the best system possible to, uh, to, to let's say, support uh, education. And I think this is one of the very positive aspects aspect of this, uh, this event of DHS2 in general, is the fact that we have this community of users that can not only pitch in ideas, but also can, can customize the tool uh, to their own needs and make sure that the tool evolves uh, along uh, their education system. So I will leave it at this for now, and I will be happy to uh, pursue the discussion with uh, the panelists a bit later today. Thank you. Should I sit? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm not that very short, uh, okay. uh, but I'm very short, and uh, it's due to my mom, who is short, also Sophia. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for that interesting introduction, and, um, uh, and again, as we have seen, we are all the products of education, uh, and some of us in the HISP, we have also become teachers at some point, when we are training and doing, you know, uh, conducting academies, I think we become teachers, and I think we need to learn from the, 
the definitions of uh, the education and then be able to uh, better result and produce uh, good outputs for implementing DHIS2. So um, uh, I'm Prosper Behumbize. I work with HISP Uganda and I'm um, also excited to be, have been part of this journey for the DHIS4 education since 2018. And, um, and I've been uh, on the journey together with uh, the, the team that uh, is going to be sharing today's uh, uh, use case or experience uh, from the field. And I'm here to introduce and uh, usher on the stage uh, our colleagues uh, from the uh, Kingdom of Iswatini. And um, we'll start with Nel Siwe uh, Damine, who is uh, the, the acting director of, Ed of IMIS and the Ministry of Education and Training. And uh, has been, she has been the core behind the implementation of DHIS2. Welcome on stage, um, Nel Siwe, and thank you very much for honoring us. Uh, we were also going to, supposed to be having Stan uh, on, on, online and also present with us here uh, from the planning, but unfortunately he was not able to make it here, but we are with him and I think he's online. And I also want to usher in uh, Victor Cambre, uh, who is from the UNICEF Eswatini, uh, also the education specialist who has also had the journey uh, of supporting the Eswatini uh, to implementing the DHIS2. And my colleague again, um, Sophia, uh, we will have um, a, a series of questions to really help us understand how the journey has started, what it is up to now, and, um, and uh, what we can be able to learn from this, because uh, education, as we've, we've shared, uh, DHIS for education started in 2018, but as we start counting, there are a lot of interest. So I will first hand it over to my colleague, Sophia. Thank you so much, Prosper. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us for this panel. We really appreciate it, and I think there's been a very special a special way of working from the beginning when I've seen how uh, HISP Uganda, UNICEF Eswatini and the Ministry have come together um, for the project, which is now quite a few years in the making. And the, the baby is starting to, I would say, crawl. Others would say walk, others would say growing still. Um, but we thought it would be really good for us to first ask you, Nelly, um, maybe, maybe for the audience to know a little bit more about the personal identi uh, um, ID number driven system. Um, because it is quite unique, and how you feel kind of the vision around that, how you feel that this, is, this having this ID is able to connect you to different departments, different services, etc. So maybe, maybe we could start with that one. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, Eswatini, tiny country, <laughs> landlocked between South Africa and Mozambique for those who have never been there. Um, as a Ministry of Education and Training, we, there was a need, Sophia, first and foremost. Uh, when we say, first, when we say PIN, we mean a personal identification number. For us in the country, the Ministry of Home Affairs, um, us not usually, we have personal identification numbers which are unique to individuals. They're supposed to get that at birth and registration. Uh, and for foreigners working there, they, they are supposed to have it. And again, for refugees, we do give the, the Ministry of Home Affairs, do give them like temporal pins. Why temporal pins being used? Uh, the financial sector, the health sector, um, the mobile network sectors of late, um, they all use that. You can't get any service without that, without a, an ID or a personal identification number in the country. So for, for us, it made sense when it came to tracking and identifying learners using their PIN because they are supposed to have it. And for you to get education at the primary level because uh, the country is a core signatory for the, F, the um, what do we call this? Sorry. I'm nervous. Free <laughs> <laughs> uh, for free education, free primary education. So, what question? Hello. Hey. Hello. My name is Mulus Mali from Zambia.
country. But for that service to be provided to anyone living in the country, you have to have the pin. So then we thought, if that is the case, we are entering the education uh, sector as a person, you're supposed to have a pin. Why not just use that to track you and see where you move from? So that's how it began. And then again, we have to know, even if it's primary, then you are elevating or transitioning to another, sec another level, which is the secondary. We have the Ministry of um, the Social Service Ministry, which is the Deputy Prime Minister's office. They provide services for orphaned and vulnerable children. And again, you have to have the pin. Mm. So it makes sense for us to say, in as much as we as Emmys, I'm glad that you introduced the whole Emmys concept to the health people. <laughs> <laughs> I think you get it now. Uh, we, we uh, as OVCs, you need to have the pin to get the services. This doesn't just it's not only for Emmys to say we are tracking and looking how the services are being provided and to whom, but we're also saying that for all these ministries and the schools to take accountability of the funds being provided by the government, they have to have a way of monitoring. We have to have a way of monitoring who is being supported and the funds, are they going to the right people? And are they doing what it's supposed to be doing at school level? Abuse of uh, finances, it's, it's, a, it's a thing in everyone's country, I'm sure. But then you have to manage it. You have to have account accountability for that. And as a unit, we task the responsibility to ensure that moni monitoring of all the programs that are being given to schools, given to institutions, we, it made sense for us to say, no, let's use the PIN, let's track individuals. If a certain school says we are providing services to 100 learners, who are the 100 learners? And are they there? Are they attending? Are they getting the books that they're supposed to give? Are they getting the teachers that are relevantly qualified to give them the education that we need? So that's the whole concept to monitor that, that it's being done. Thank you for that. And I remember we had quite a powerful moment in, in uh, Eswatini when we were there for an assessment of the, the upgrade to the system, where there was a teacher who told us that before she just knew there was an amount of overseas uh, orphans and vulnerable children in her classroom um, and saw that a child was always coming late to class. But now with having the details, she was able to know why that child comes late to class and maybe interact to understand how she can support with a breakfast in the morning. Or So it's been quite interesting to see how that has been started at national le level, but is starting to have a ripple effect as well. Yeah, coming to that, we, we have been used to the notion of saying to schools, report on the number of learners in your school, report on the infrastructure, report on your teaching and learning materials that you are, you are getting. But then when it comes to individual, because we should be, as country, we should move away from the notion of just, this is aggregate information that is being provided to, to UNESCO for one, SDGs responding to those indicators, responding to your UNICEF because they are giving you funds somehow. <laughs> and then we are trying to move away from that notion to say, at the end of the day, we are dealing with human that we have to be accountable for. Mm. So if this particular learner is coming in every day late, and then you are monitoring and seeing the progress of what is happening. It has an impact on the, on the scores they'll be getting, obviously, and it will have an impact on that life at a later stage. So while we are saying, in as much as we're collecting and accounting for resources at school level, but then again, we should move away from that and account for the individual in all perspective, economically, socially, and also Mentally, because mm. we are moving into that space now to say mentally, is this child ready for progressing in mm. life?
Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Just taking on from uh, uh, providing funds, and uh, this is what everybody needs to be able to implement and sustain. Uh, from the literature and from what we've been able to, to gather and work with the, the ESWA team, and uh, even before we came into the space, UNICEF has been uh, supporting the journey of uh, the Ministry of Health in strengthening the education system. And, um, and I know, Victor, you've played a big role. You've been uh, in the forefront of this. And we have so many partners here that we are calling up to really support this uh, implementation. Even in, the, in health, we are still also struggling and calling partners to, to support this. So uh, if you could share with us, you know, what are some of those, you know, behind scenes or whatever is happening and how you encourage and call up partners to be able to support strengthening and supporting sustainable education management information systems in uh, ministries of education. Victor. Thank you, Prosper. A very good morning, uh, colleagues. Victor Gambule is already introduced, working for UNICEF as education specialist in Eswatini. Uh, maybe let me start uh, the sharing on uh, where all this started um, in 2018. Prosper, you say you've been around this partnership uh, since 2018. That's pretty much the time UNICEF also got into this space and worked with the Minister of Education. It started with an assessment of the system that the Minister of Education was using at the time, access-based, paper-based system. Uh, that the ministry wanted to improve. It had issues around timeliness of reports. I think we were getting reports after a time lapse of about two years. And of course, the ministry had identified, as my colleague had mentioned here, the need of transitioning to a more efficient system. So UNICEF, through our regional office based in Nairobi, a, a team came to the country to do an assessment of the system so that we understand what we're currently operating on so that we can also better define the transition. Uh, and the minister was very clear that uh, it needed a system that can track the learner as already alluded. And we then looked around and uh, uh, consulted uh, countries that were already uh, aware of DHS2, especially for health. And uh, at the time, we were being advised that there is consideration also to implement the same in education. So some of, that's uh, some of the behind the scenes work that we did, the assessment, and uh, of course engaging with the Minister of Education on this possible transition. Uh, maybe worth highlighting here, what made our job much easier is that already there was willingness uh, from the government to consider uh, another system beyond or that besides the one that they were used to. And maybe also to highlight that uh, moving from uh, your comfort zone uh, to maybe uh, an un uh, unfamiliar terrain, that uh, was one of the challenges which we had really to work uh, with government uh, to, to, to overcome. But what was uh, important at the time was that uh, UNICEF had a very good uh, working relationship with the Minister of Education. So when we recommended DHS2, it was not difficult for the ministry to consider and adopt. And uh, we supported the team to actually look at other systems that were available in the region. Uh, and then I think finally we, the ministry circled for DHS2. And uh, like I already highlighted, it's, it's very, very, it was very, very important to remain available and support the process through. And I think uh, the colleague, my colleague has actually highlighted that it's a system that is already being implemented. It was launched uh, in March this year. And it's been a very long but fulfilling journey. Thank you very much. And, and again, uh, really what we pick out of this, it's, it's not at all about money. It's the commitment of the partner and the minister, together with the ministry, to be able to deliver this. So we really appreciate the UNICEF support that has been behind this. And again, we can see that you are again on the stage with them. So thank you very much. And, um,
Jake, yes. So we have seen quite recently, uh, we were sent a YouTube link to the, the budget speech. We've seen numerous uh, newspaper articles uh, throughout the implementation, and just recently when you did your official launch, the observer from Esotini was there at the launch, uh, documenting and sharing, you know, we had the 16th day survey already, numbers coming through. So all of this is really showing a real government-wide support to the, to, to the, the project um, and for strengthening uh, data systems in the country. Can you share with us a little bit more what were some of the, the strategies or the hard work behind the scenes that we were not seeing? Because really, when we received that link to the budget speech and it was presented, I think recently now you've also just had some more success uh, with the Ministry of Finance. Can you share a little bit more? This is a, a, a question to both Nelly and to, to Victor. What's some of that hard work behind the scenes that's been actually going on? Um, thank you, Sophia, for that. Um, actually, when the budget speech of the Ministry of Finance, because, again, uh, when we, we were looking for which system to use to monitor and track learners throughout the system, then DHIS2 came in, and we're all worried that it was a health-based system. But we took courage in the fact that the health is tracking everyone who is ever need or ever need a, a health service, their health service providers. So then we're like, if health is doing that for everyone, education might, might as well do that. And our, um, when we went in to say, the system can track actually the learner in school and can take accountability for the free primary education grants being distributed to school, they can take accountability to say, so and so has received education in this certain education institution and at this point in time, or oh, this academic year, which I learned that the, the three key points of DHIS to the who, where, and when. So, for that, it was, let's do this. Minister of Finance was way just behind it that if we can account for every penny or every cent that government is putting into the education sector, well and good, let's do it. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And maybe just to add that, um, Sophia were mentioning that uh, DHS2, the transition in Eswatin was actually mentioned in the budget speech. This is for us a sign of a government commitment to, to the system. The political will that I earlier mentioned is actually one of those things that's very, very key to drive this. And government is actually already supporting financially the rollout, the implementation of uh, this very important intervention. And in fact, uh, education in Eswatini is the first sector that is implementing, uh, and I can uh, confirm that uh, it has also uh, generated interest from the Minister of Health. Uh, in fact, uh, they, they are aware that this is a health, uh, uh, initially it is a health-oriented system, and they are seeing government, I mean, uh, education implementing, and they are now motivated to also follow suit. So I think uh, this has been very, very important in that sense, as well as uh, inspiring also the other sectors to consider to implement. But also maybe one would have missed a very important uh, point in actually acknowledging the support uh, that we have received throughout this journey from specifically HIPS Uganda and uh, 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 the team uh, has really been so supportive and also at some point we were linked with uh, his uh, Mozambique, uh, our neighbors. And uh, this uh, structure has been very instrumental in ensuring that uh, we get the support and motivation that we needed and the confidence really to move from a system that uh, government has always used to a system that uh, everyone was learning something. And we implemented this 
at a time when it was very difficult to move around because this was during uh, COVID and at some point we had to do work remotely, but the determination to get things done led us to where we are today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, and taking it from the, um, when we stepped in the space of education, uh, data quality trust was one of the biggest issues. Like when we are telling the, the education team that you need the school to collect their data and submit it, it was one of the things they have never heard about. And so it was very difficult because traditionally, the national level would go to the schools, collect all the data, bring it up to the national level, enter it, many months and months compiling the data and entering it, and then of course uh, the quality would also be another issue. But we have seen a Swatini really move direct from the national level to the school, to where they have interested the teachers to be able to collect the data, get the tablet, enter it into the system. So uh, to Nelly, we wanted you to share a little bit about this mind change and what you've been able to do to ensure the quality, the timeliness, and the trust within the data that has been collected by the school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, change of mindset is something difficult, I tell you. So with the uh, uh, schools, are mandated to report to the MEs. So we've been collecting information from schools since 2004, and it has always been paper-based. Then we enter the information at national level. Uh, then you come with DHIS2, and then you're telling now the schools to say, we want real-time data. We've been consistently I was telling her yesterday that ooh, at least we have been consistently late in reporting. <laughs> Two years later, rest assured, Eswatin will be submitting their reports on education, but then for planning purposes and, and accountability purposes, you can say two years ago, this is right, and this today you can't even mention the number of learners in school. So with this, it was real time. You enter the information now, the analysis is there, the tables are there, the dashboard is there for you to see. You can't even question or lie about it to your principals. And then we went to the schools to say, now it's your responsibility to enter that information at that particular given time that we will need it. So we have census dates, and then you are supposed to be done as a school by then, which is much for us. Coming to the school's principals to tell them that those papers uh, will be a thing of the past. We are moving to tablet, to a web-based system, and we'll be, we will know that you have reported or not there and day, and we will call you. It was daunting at first, but then exciting later to say, when they saw the dashboards, to say, this is your school, because we had the legacy data already inputted by the, the HISP Uganda team. Uh, they could see their trends, and then they were questioning even their data at certain points that what happened to this, why do we have the drop? in enrollments, and then the others were answering, no, 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 it's during the time that certain schools was open, another school was established on next to us, so learners were going there. Coming to teachers, you know when you, when you fill in questionnaires anyway, airport or whatever, you just do it because you just want to go get through with the, with the whole process yeah. of filling in that information. You don't even think about why they need that information from you. Why are they looking for your mobile number in a whatever? You don't think about that. But then it came to when it came to the quality of data that was being seen, that was being forwarded to us. We had to then go back to all the schools, uh, have focal teachers. They have focal teachers. 
that have to fill in the information, explain each and every question why we need that information. If we say we're asking why, uh, how long does a child take to move from home to school, that's information, it's an international standard that we want to see. But then again, it will inform them how they use that information, will inform them on how they can assist and also provide better education or services to that particular land. So we had to go through that training all, the, all of the 916 teachers on the form, and then we move from the form to say the data element responds to this indicator, and this is how we, we respond to it, and be factual as you can, because if you lie tomorrow, the following year, this dashboard will be showing the trend, and will be answer, you'll have to be answerable to say why the change is there, because you can easily see it. So we train them on that, and then we train them on the system, and then we use the same dashboards to, for, with their information okay. to, make their, to make them see how their data, what their data says. And then we borrowed another thing, another lesson from health, um, a data quality assurance monitoring tool, whereby we went with the team to schools to say, you said in your annual education census, which is an aggregate form, you have 200 learners. And then the individual learners that you, you have in your line list is 205, if there's this, this, that difference. And then we went further to say, from the class registers, because they are still paper-based, they, the way they manage their schools, they have class registers you have 109th, I'm making an example. What is the difference? Explain. Different numbers, different data sources, same school, what is the difference? So we, we are using that methodology to say, let us not only look at what is being fed in the system, let us also go to the schools to look at what is physically there. We would love to get into class at some point to count the learners in that certain class to say, yes, you had 25 learners in your line list and you have 25 learners in your aggregate and surely we can physically see the 25 learners. So yeah, ensuring that the data is credible at, it, at, at its best, we have taken the lessons that HISP Uganda came with and we're implementing that. Thank you, good lessons. Uh, UNESCO, you, yeah. you again, I think you're surprised to the level of that, yeah, you can. No, no, but I, I think, I mean, we're making very good points. And I think, so, like, as a reminder, I mean, the magnitude of the volume that an education sector deals with of people, of processes, is, is, is really, uh, I mean, yeah, <laughs> duplicated, I think, uh, regarding the data I saw from the health sector. Just to give an example, yesterday, I, I was looking at, very quickly, uh, the data from Ethiopia, just for primary education, there are 37,000 facilities. So I think that's kind of a small or medium health system, no? Mm -hmm. Is it? And there's about almost 2 million students, daily users of these schools. And so it means that if you want to record the daily use of a school, of 37,000 school daily, or sometimes there are two shifts in school, mm -hmm. uh, you, you really have to have strong processes. And the, the, the issue of quality and the uh, trust uh, that you mentioned also is, is paramount. I think it's paramount in a, any sector, but I used to work at UIS, so the UNESCO office responsible for monitoring SDG, and I had a director that was saying, uh, he was saying it, he was Dutch, but he was saying it in French. Um, it's, le, la, la confiance vient au pas, elle repart au galop, meaning trust comes walking, but leaves running. <laughs> and so if you cannot build that trust in the data, mm -hmm. not only it will not be used, mm -hmm. but people will just, won't report and won't make the effort. And so building trust in a data system is what, it's not necessarily really regarding data, but it's, it's like kind of the um, end result that you want to have when you, when you build these emesses or health uh, hisses <laughs> or, 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 or whatever the system. Um, and, and we know from, from practice, from research, that the more uh, people are involved 
in the data collection processes and data use processes, the more they will report better quality, yeah. more frequently, so avoiding delays, and also the, the, the more engaged they will be by using these results. And so the example of the dashboards, I mean, uh, anyone who has worked in a, in a school or in a district knows that you, know, you, you typically would send the data up and it would stay up. There's no gravity, right? You just send the data up and it never comes down. <laughs> and so, and so, and, and we know, uh, and we know that building this, this, what some, some people call uh, ownership, you know, uh, or engagement, uh, uh, this is the idea that, well, we, we, we talked a lot about micro planning in, in this forum, but it's the idea that the more the local uh, uh, users and the local, um, those people who deliver the service will be engaged in the policy making, in the processes, in the, and the, the different requirement, the more they will be engaged, the more they will own the processes, and actually the better trust they will be, the better results they will be, and so every, it's kind of a virtual loop, basically. And so, um, and so basically this brings me to the last point I wanted to make, uh, listening to you, colleagues, is that uh, what we're doing when we are building MSs with DHS2, with other systems, is we're building this data culture. And so data culture is way beyond statistics, way beyond data points, and uh, coding, um, but it's basically what we're trying to build in the education sector. Thank you very much. Um, I think that was a wonderful way to help us reflect on, on, on what we've heard from the ministry and from UNICEF. Thank you so much. And I think we can open for maybe a few questions, if there's any from the audience, before we move into our final session for this morning. So, please feel free. Ah, yes. One so hard to see. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Hersi. I'm from Somalia. I'm the director of uh, PSM, but I spent some time on the EMIS uh, in the last uh, one year. So I have a question on uh, on on how the ICT uh, in education and EMIS work together in your, in your department. We know that ICT and, and EMIS have some relationships, and uh, do you have an ICT expertise within the department? Or how does the EMIS uh, work with the ICT team if it's in, in another department? My other question is, uh, is the biometric attendance. Have you implemented any biometric attendance in your country? or is it uh, taken manually and then entered into the system? Uh, my last question is, the, do you have uh, uh, programs like school feeding, uh, uh, I, you know, school health programs, and if these are uh, implemented in your, in your country, okay. does the system uh, cater for these programs and collect information for analysis? Thank you. Okay, okay. thank you. You can easily tell that he knows Emis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, for us, um, I think one thing that I haven't mentioned is how short-staffed we are. Most Emis units have like ICTs, the planners and stuff, but we are really short-staffed. So, moving to um, Ensuring that we we trained with the teams, um, teachers, it made sense to us. Uh, we only have one T support person in the unit, and we had to get on board with the system very quickly. Luckily, we're fast learners, so yeah, mm -hmm. was managing that. And then coming to the school programs, we are monitoring everything that it has to do with education in institutions. And within the, the form, when uh, the data collection form for individuals, like for the learners, we have the different sector, uh, sections. We have one on the learner profile, then we have on OVC status of that particular learner, special education need of that particular learner, and if they are receiving like meals. We both have those questions in aggregate and also individual level. We have that and what was the other one? Um, it's, 
It's good fielding, yes, we do have that. We monitor that too. Mm. Yeah, it, it's broad, it's across. All the programs being implemented in the education sector and also at school level, we monitor that at aggregate level, that is the school annual censuses, and also at um, individual learners. We also look across that. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. One more question, um, and then we can, yeah. Merci. Désolé, je vais encore parler en français. Euh, je suis Daniel du Togo. And are you here? <laughs> oh, Amélie, sorry. Sorry. OK. Merci pour le partage d'expérience de l'équipe de Swatini. Euh, J'ai deux petites questions. Je voudrais euh, savoir, est-ce que euh, ce système euh, étudie la contribution des acteurs communautaires pour, par exemple, euh, euh, capter euh, le nombre d'enfants qui, qui, qui ne sont pas scolarisés, qui devaient l'être, par exemple Juste une curiosité pour savoir. La, la, la seconde question, euh, est-ce qu'il y a une connexion entre le DISH de, pour l'éducation et celui de la santé pour pouvoir permettre certaines analyses. Merci. Merci. So the question is, the, the, the other question. So thank you, Eswatini, for sharing the experience. Um, he has a question on the, the system that you use. So how, uh, or is there rather a, um, a possibility for contribution from local actors and community actors? Uh, the question is re related to identification of um, children that are not in school. Um, and the second question was, uh, is the system connected, like, are, is the system for education connected to the system for health? Or are there kind of uh, connections between the two data systems? Um, okay, for uh, Messi. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for the out of school, uh, for the out of school learners, uh, it's a it's a good valid point. Thank you for that. Uh, I think we need to work with the community to to see how we find that we find those learners and bring them back to the education. Thank you for that contribution. Um, and then for oh okay. We are exploring that because for, for the Ministry of Health, we have the school health programs that usually use our data for, for, for their planning purposes and also for, for s distributing services to, to learners in school. So we are looking forward to doing that just right now because we like Sophia said, the baby is crawling for us. Mm -hmm. So linking the, the health information with the education, it would only make sense. I think by the end of, year, of the year, we should have done that. What I've appreciated as well, Nelly, is you're like, let's get our foundation steady yeah. before we start, because there's a lot of interest to keep adding. Yeah. So really, I think we can uh, say thank you very much to, to everyone who's been on stage today. Will you help us to give a warm round of applause to, to you all? I say, Niabong, Siabong, eh? Siabong, eh? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, just for the lessons learned through this whole experience with uh, Eswatini and together with, Zan with, the, with the Gambia, We've been able to extend and start working with now, um, uh, I think our team is busy setting up uh, South Sudan, the TVET section. Uh, we're working with the Minister of Education in South Sudan. And we also have uh, Nigeria also coming up, and um, uh, Ethiopia and Rwanda and the rest are all coming up. So this is one of the initiatives that you can take back home and be able to implement uh, alongside health. And, uh, and again, if you come to the afternoon sessions, you will be able to hear how Uganda has tried to work alongside with health to be able to implement this. So uh, when we started the journey of uh, the DHS for Education um, in 2018, 
we were using mostly the core and we wanted to really build everything on the core that is using the tracker and so quite often we are on the doors of the tracker developers uh, trying to change this, change that to be able to suit the education needs. Um, so um, last year, during the same conference, uh, a small team sat in the room and said, I think it's time to start the, the discussions of the extension of DHIS2. And so uh, we conceived the idea of uh, coming up with CIMIS, which is coming up very soon here. That was introduced in the plenary by Christine, so it's an extension and uh, it's a tool that is being carefully designed, or an app that is carefully being designed to ensure that it also serves back in health because we are learning from each side. So a lot of the functionality that you may see here may be very interesting for health, for health implementation, but wait a bit, it will all be uh, coming together. But I'm just happy to introduce um, Alfredo um, Changa from uh, uh, Saudictas, he's from Mozambique, who has been leading a team of developers across the HISP network. This is one of the areas where we have also been collaborating, not for the first time, but uh, in a better way to deliver one product that we can quickly be able to use. So uh, I will applaud the, um, uh, Alfredo and his team for the leadership, um, HISP Sri Lanka, HISP West Africa, HISP Uganda, and all the others that have contributed. So we're just going to give you a snapshot <laughs> of what you expect to see in the in the plenary session, so please uh, uh, join us. If the numbers are very many, we can come back to this main plenary, <laughs> but we want you to come and be able to learn how this tool works. So, Alfredo, over to you. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Prosper, and good morning to everyone. Just waiting for the slide to come. So, I will be uh, presenting uh, the, se the SEMIS uh, app. Basically, uh, SEMIS is the this is to a uh, tracker module for the education sector. And I will I explain about the process that was taken in order to develop the, the, the application, how the system is designed, what is the structure, and how flexible it is, or how can it be implemented uh, in different domains. So SEMIS, uh, as I said, is a tracker uh, implementation, and basically, is based on the education sector concepts. And what we, we, we did is create a platform that can be used to plan. So at the beginning of the academic year, there are some planning activities that are taken. So we plan, we enroll students, we update the teacher details, and we do uh, other activities. We also perform some uh, continuous activities, like taking attendance, uh, recording the marks uh, for, for the, for the uh, evaluation and exams. And, and at the end of the year, we need to know who is going to be promoted to the next academic year, who failed uh, to pass the exams and other activities. So basically, we do all of that on this uh, SEMIS application. And we took a very long journey to have what we have now. Uh, we started from a different isolated application. So here we have some examples of some apps that were built separately. So each ISP group was working on their own strategies to have something to solve uh, local, local needs. Uh, then we discussed, as was mentioned last year, and we established a kind of uh, DJ2 for Education technical team. And the idea was to see how can we join our, 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 our activities and our strategies in order to build a solution that is common for all uh, of, of the DHS2 implementers. And uh, based on that, a team was established. Uh, we have Saudigit, his Uganda, his West Central Africa, his uh, Sri Lanka, and of course, uh, coordinated in coordination with the, the, the his center. And basically what we do is we do requirements gathering so we're doing DJ2 implementation for education in the field. So we know what the ministry wants to, 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 to have in the system. So we discuss about that. We prioritize. So we define, based on our implementations, what are we going to do first and what are we going to do after that. And then come the uh, 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 technology part, where we do the, the, the development. 
So we have different developers for all of these HISPs here. So we, we share the task, we work, and finally, we also share the resource. What are resources? We share training materials, we share field implementation experience. I mean, we share everything in order to better uh, uh, go ahead. And one of the biggest challenges that we had is the data model. We had several data models uh, in order to make sure that we have a system that is working uh, for the DGS2 uh, uh, sector. I have here more details that we'll be sh sharing during the uh, DGS2 for education sections. So at the end of the day, what do we have? Well, we have a system with uh, different modules. The first one is the enrollment module, so we can enroll the student. We have the attendance module, we can take attendance. We have performance module, we can record the uh, performance values. Uh, we have the final result module, where we can assign the final result. And also, we have the transfer module. So we can move teachers for one school to another one. We can move students for one school to another one using this, 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 this module. I will now uh, quickly go to the, to the demo. Uh, I'm here now, logged in, has uh, a school uh, user. And once I, 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 I go to the uh, application, I'm going to have the, uh, the, the SEMIS app, that is the one that's going to be used by the uh, local staff. We have the SEMIS school calendar, so we can define what are the school days for that country, what are the holidays, and, and other, other kind of events. So when I'm taking attendance, I know that I will not uh, make the attendance module available during the weekends, for example, if the weekends are non-school days. And uh, if it's a holiday, I know that I won't take attendance during the holidays. And we do that using the school calendar. So each country can configure the, uh, the system based on their own uh, reality. And we also have the semi configuration application that is more for the system administrator to link the tracker model with the user interface. So now I will go through the different modules. I will just do a quick demonstration, and later on during the afternoon, I will do a, a, a deep dive uh, for in some of the modules. So I'll just select this one. This is the uh, enrollment module. As I said, I'm logged in as uh, a teacher in, in uh, a specific school. Once I, I, I come here, I have to specify the school. I have to specify uh, the grade. So I select here, I have different grades. And also, I have to specify the class or the, or the section. And everything on the education sector is done based on academic here. So everything we do is based on uh, academic here. So I have here this uh, example where I, 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 I just uh, selected uh, some, some records. So uh, here, what I want to do is basically enrollment. We want to enroll new students. So I will take uh, an empty uh, class. And we have here this option to enroll uh, a single student. Uh, when you do that, the system brings uh, a form where you can fill the enrollment details, uh, the academic year, the grade, the class. You can fill the student profile, so what you usually call uh, the target entity attributes on the DHS2 world. And we also have the general details that most of the times uh, uh, are socioeconomic details, most of the times are socioeconomic related uh, values. And we fill here what we want to, to, to fill. But we also have uh, a bulk uh, enrollment option. As we might know, in most of the time, it may, might be very uh, hard to do data entry one by one. So basically what we did is, uh, at the school level, the, the users can come and download a data entry template. So they can come here, they select the academic year, and then they say how many students they want to import in the system. I can say I want to create 20 records. So I download the, the template. So I have one here, download, download it, and with some, some data. So we're just going to, to refresh it. So as you can see, I, I have here uh, the, the 20 students. I can uh, change whatever I want to, to change. If I want to change the, 
uh, the gender, I have here the predefined options, I do whatever I want to do, and I fill the data. And once I'm done, I can, uh, of course, take this data back to the, to the system. So basically, I come here, I click Enroll New Students, I select the file that I want to, to enroll, and then I start the, 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 the import, the system will process and will give me the output. So you can see that I have 20 new students, I don't have any possible duplicates, and I don't have any invalid record. So I can dry run or I can import uh, uh, the student. So the system will process and all students are imported. And now, as you can see, I have the students and I'm ready to, to go ahead. So this is a feature that was taken for the uh, Hispuganda import wizard application. So basically what we did is we converted the, the, the task in a more user-friendly way in order to be easy to be used at the local, local level. So now I have my students. What I do now? Now I want to take attendance. I just click on attendance module. So once I do that, I will be, I will be given this list. I will just select a school with some values. So I come here. Uh, I say view attendance by uh, specific dates. So I click on the calendar and say uh, I want to view attendance for the last week. So when I do that, let me just switch to a different uh, grade. So when I do that, the system will show me the attendance status for my school, for my grade, and for my class. So I can see what's happening. So I can navigate using the calendar. So something else that we want to, to improve is to reduce the absenteeism. So we know that in some countries, we have a lot of problems with girl, young girls that start school, but then don't go based on different reasons. So what we have is we focus more on the absence. So if you want, for example, to see the reason of absence for those that are on red, you just click here, and you can see that what is the reason of absence for all of them. And you can take some actions based, based on that. If, if you want to take a new attendance, you basically select the date. I would, let's say I want to take attendance for today. I just click today, and then I call by the names, and they mark the attendance status. Basically, I'm calling. I say absent or present. If it's absent, I need to specify the reason of absence. And this is flexible. We don't limit the number of, of, of uh, attendance status. You can set up late or something else. And of course, we don't limit the reason of absence. You do it based on your own uh, configurations. The next one is the performance module. So on the performance side, we, we can record uh, 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 um, uh, uh, results based on some predefined uh, uh, exam type. On this case, we are using a term rule approach. So at the end of each term, we want to record the term result for each student on the different subjects that they, they have. But if you want, if you think the term rule is too much, you can say, okay, I just want to record the annual result. And you can just take uh, the data once per year. And if you think that you have enough resource, you can say, I want to take it like daily. Every time that there is one exam is taken, I want to record the values. That is something that is also flexible. And if you want to uh, record performance value, you just select the, the, the grade, the school, the grade, the class. You select the term and then you, you start filling the, the values based on, on what you, you want on, on, and how you prefer to, to do. So if you, as you can see, once the value is sent to the database, uh, the, the, uh, the border changed to green, meaning the data is, is saved. So now I will, perform to, I will go to the next module, that is the transfer module, and on this side, we have two workflows. One is the outgoing transfer. So it means we are sending students for our school to a different one. And then we have the incoming transfer. It means that someone is sending uh, students to my school. Um, and we have here also a predefined workflow. If I want to perform a new transfer, I basically select the student that I want to, per to, to transfer and click here on execute transfer. I select the school that I want to send, and then I, I specify the reason that I want to, to move the student for this one to another one. After that, I just click here, and the student is sent. And you can see now that I have this 
uh, pending um, uh, status, one hour ago, uh, time zone things. Uh, on, on the incoming side, uh, when someone sends a student to my school, I need to approve or reject. So here I have one that was approved, and then this one is not yet validated. So I can choose if I want to approve or if I want to reject. If, for example, I want to approve, I just click here, and I say confirm that I want to move for this school to mine. I say yes, and everything is okay. The student is approved. Finally, we have the final result module. So as I said, at the end of the academic year, we need to assign a final result. So what we do is, uh, I, select, I always select the grade, school, and, and, and class. It's, it's mandatory for the education side. So I will now just uh, take some examples. I select my, my school, um, I select my, my grade, let's say grade two, and then I select uh, also my, my class. So I have this list of students, and I am now at the end of the academic year, and they want to assign final result. I do the same, I select the students. First of all, I want to select those that are promoted, so I select, and then I say, I assign a final result to promote it, and I say, okay, promote, the student that I selected. As you can see, they are all promoted. And I can say that there are some students that unfortunately, they didn't pass to the next level, so I can say that they, they failed. As you can see, it's failed. And also, we have one special option that is the dropout option. And here you can say dropout. I say dropout is special because when you drop out, basically you are seeing that the student is not active for that particular academic here. So after doing that, I can now move these students from this year to the next academic year. The procedure is similar. I just select the one that I want to move. I click on perform promotion. I select the year. They are now on grade two. I want to send them to grade three, next academic year. And then uh, I say that I don't yet know at which class they will be. And once I'm done with that, I click on, on update, and you can see the summary. The students were promoted to the next uh, academic year. And if I go there, I will see the, the, the students. So basically, that's what the, the, the system can do. Uh, what we are planning to, to do now um, is to expand the, 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 the system in order to be uh, more usable. Because of that, we have the mobile version. So in the mobile version, you can now uh, take attendance and also you can perform the, the, the performance module. And what we want to, to do is to make sure that we release uh, this uh, uh, different application in a standalone approach so they can be used in other domains. For example, uh, the attendance module, if we make it a standalone application, we can use it, we can use it for community uh, sessions. We implement a lot of community health sessions where we give some uh, training, some group training, and we can basically take attendance using this module. We can also apply it on TB DOT or other uh, uh, health-related uh, use case, for example. Uh, the performance, so performance is the most uh, flexible one because it's basically a bulk data entry. So if you have any uh, uh, system that you want to implement and you want to do a bulk data entry, you can use this performance module. You can change the name to whatever you want to, to, to call and you can use it. And we also have the transfer module that we can, for example, use to manage the uh, equipment life cycle. So we can move equipment from one health facility to a different one. We can approve, reject, and do all, all of that. So if you want to learn more about uh, DGS2 for Education, you can visit the DGS2 for Education website. You can also view uh, and test the, the system by yourself on the uh, uh, demo site, on the digitalization demo site. And of course, you can join uh, our session today uh, on the auditorium tour for 10.30 to 12, and also for 1 p.m. to uh, 20 past two. Uh, that's all for my site, and thank you.